Welcome back. In the last video, we saw the conversion of 2-amino-3-carboxymuconate 6-semialdehyde all the way down to alpha-ketoadipate. And we talked about how alpha-ketoadipate gets consumed by the alpha-ketoadipate dehydrogenase complex. And mechanistically, we said this enzyme complex was identical to pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, uh, the branch chain alpha keto acid dehydrogenase complex, they're all mechanistically identical. They all have the three different subunits, the E1, the E2, the E3. And we saw that that enzyme 2, which is basically our dihydrolipoyl transacetylase, gives us this guy right here, which is glutaryl S-CoA. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the catabolic pathway for glutaryl S-CoA. And what we're going to see is when we do this pathway, it's a pseudo form of beta oxidation. Notice that what we have is very similar to a fatty acid that's been activated, right? We have our coenzyme A, right? And we have sort of a fatty acid, except the only problem is, is that it ends in a carboxylate. That's unlike what we've seen in normal beta oxidation. But what we're going to see is that the pathway is actually very similar. And the only difference between this and normal beta oxidation is the first enzyme. And the first enzyme that we have here is called glutaryl S-CoA dehydrogenase. Now, this enzyme mechanistically is going to be identical to the fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase that we saw in normal beta oxidation. So what it's going to do is it's going to oxidize these two carbons right here that are part of, well, this would be the alpha carbon and this would be the beta carbon. So it's going to oxidize these two carbons and form an alkene. And specifically, it's our trans alkene, right, that we would normally see in beta oxidation. And this molecule that we generate through this dehydrogenase is glutaconyl S-CoA. And, of course, we take the electrons from glutaryl S-CoA and we transfer them onto FADH2. Okay, so before we do anything else, let's talk about the FADH2. Okay. The FADH2 is going to transfer its electrons through a series of proteins. The initial electron acceptor from FADH2 is going to be something called electron transferring flava protein. And of course, it's going to start out in the oxidized state, and it's going to pick up the electrons from FADH2, of course, regenerating FAD and the resting state of glutaryl CoA dehydrogenase. And it's going to, you're going to get electron transferring flava protein in the reduced state. Well, then the electron transferring flavor protein is going to donate its, ele its electrons to another enzyme, which is called electron transferring flavor protein ubiquinone oxidoreductase. And when this enzyme gets a hold of those electrons, it's going to catalyze the, the transfer of those electrons to, to oxidize coenzyme Q or ubiquinone and reduce it to ubiquinol. So our yield from this part of the reaction should be one reduced ubiquinol or coenzyme Q reduced. And that reduced coenzyme Q is going to feed into complex three of the mitochondria respiratory chain, right? Or we could call it cytochrome C ubiquinol oxidoreductase. And this particular enzyme is is going to catalyze the pumping of four protons into the inner membrane space, which of course powers the synthesis of ATP. And keep in mind that this process is going to be occurring in the liver cells, or we could say the mitochondria of liver cells, right, or the hepatocytes. So this ubiquinol that's um, that's generated is literally fueling the hepatocytes that are breaking down tryptophan. And depending what context you're watching this video, it could also be lysine that we're talking about. And certainly this is for tryptophan catabolism. But remember that lysine catabolism also merges with tryptophan catabolism at the production of alpha ketoadipate. So you could be watching this in either context. But just remember that the liver cells are doing this reaction, right? So the liver cells are benefiting from this ubiquinol production. Okay, so now we have glutaconyl CoA, but this is rapidly going to decompose with the loss of carbon dioxide. And what I wanna mention is that the loss of carbon dioxide is spontaneous. Okay, so meaning that it has a negative delta G. And so basically what will happen is as soon as the glutaconyl S-CoA dissociates from the enzyme, it just spontaneously loses carbon dioxide, and you generate this molecule right here, which is called crotonyl CoA, crotonyl CoA. And crotonyl CoA is actually a derivative of a fatty acid that you will always see in complete beta oxidation, right? It would normally be the product of beta oxidation on a four-carbon fatty acid, right, that's been activated, 
and it would appear just after you used fatty acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, right? So this is a normal fatty acid that you would see in beta oxidation when you're doing oxidation of a four carbon fatty acid. So we've seen crotonyl CoA before, especially if you have seen beta oxidation or you've seen the beta oxidation playlist. And crotonyl CoA is going to get hydrated by enoyl CoA hydratase. Okay, and this is just a simple addition reaction of an alkene or a hydration of an alkene. And and at this point, using enoyl CoA hydratase, every enzyme from here. These are enzymes that are in normal beta oxidation. So the only enzyme that was different is going to be this glutaryl S-CoA dehydrogenase. But everything else past this point is going to be exactly the same. So if you were doing normal beta oxidation, you would see enoyl-CoA hydratase. And again, it's just a simple hydration of an alkene using water. And what we end up generating in general is a beta hydroxy acyl coa but in the context of glutaryl S-CoA catabolism, it's called beta hydroxy butyryl S-CoA. Okay? And notice that, again, it is a type of beta oxidation because if this is our alpha carbon and this is our beta, Beta, we are oxidizing the beta carbon, right? We first form an alkene, then we hydroxylate it, and then we oxidize the hydroxyl group into a ketone. So the very next reaction is going to be an NAD dependent oxidation. So what we're going to do is we're going to oxidize this hydroxyl group into a ketone. And if you know beta oxidation, you know exactly what's going to happen. So we're going to use the, the oxidizing power of NAD, and we should get out an NADH, right? And of course, the NADH can be used by the hepatocytes, right? It can be used to fuel NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase or complex one of the mitochondria. And of course, that pumps four protons from the matrix into the inner membrane space. And that proton gradient that we generate is going to power ATP synthase. Okay. Now, in the process of oxidizing that hydroxyl group into a ketone, what we generate is this, acetoacetyl-CoA. Now, acetoacetyl-CoA uh, is going to get thialyzed using coenzyme A. So this re enzyme requires coenzyme A as a coenzyme. And it's going to do a nucleophilic acyl substitution effectively on this carbon right here. And so what you're going to generate using thiolase is two acetyl-CoA molecules. Now, before we go any further, I want to mention this. And this is really important. Okay, We've seen now that the glutaryl S-CoA gets degraded to two acetyl-CoA molecules. So these are two acetyl-CoAs. Now, the acetyl-CoAs that we generate in amino acid oxidation, assuming we're in the fasted state, those acetyl-CoAs will ultimately go into ketone body biosynthesis. So these will go into ketone body biosynthesis, right? Ketone body biosynthesis. And so for that reason, we call uh, this process ketogenic because we're producing acetyl-CoA, or you could say acetoacetyl-CoA, but ultimately those products go to ketone body biosynthesis. And we'll have a whole playlist on ketone body biosynthesis. And those ketone bodies can be released by the liver, and they can be exported to other tissues like the muscle and the brain, which can use them for fuel. So... It, we're going to assume, I'm going to assume that you, you're watching this in the context of tryptophan catabolism. So what have we seen? Well, we've seen that tryptophan gets degraded to acetyl-CoA, right? So in that sense, it's ketogenic, right? But we also saw way back here, way back here, that kynurinase de, uh, cleaves off alanine. And the alanine gets degraded to pyruvate through alanine transaminase, and the pyruvate can undergo gluconeogenesis to form glucose. So in that regard, it's also glucogenic. So I'm going to assume that you're watching this in the context of tryptophan catabolism, and we know that tryptophan catabolism is both glucogenic and ketogenic. It's glucogenic because you get pyruvate out of it, which can form glucose through gluconeogenesis, and it's ketogenic in the sense that we form acetyl-CoA, and those acetyl-CoAs can be used to form ketone bodies. And we'll have a whole video on ketone bi body biosynthesis, and we'll see that that can be exported by the liver, and they can be used by other tissues such as the brain. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on tryptophan catabolism. Um, in the next video, we're going to do lysine or histidine. See you soon.